Okay, hello everyone. Um, you've obviously logged on to today's session for collective bargaining and um, the discussion around collective bargaining as part of uh, the Forza campaigning summer series. We're just going to give it another minute or two just because um, it, it seems a lot of people log on um, a few minutes past the hour. So if you don't mind, we're just going to sit here for the next minute or two um, and allow a few more participants to log on. Okay, well, thanks for logging on to today's um, summer series on the issue of collective bargaining. There will be a few more people who will log in over the next few minutes, but what we might just do is, because we only have an hour, um, kickstart and start today's session. So just to briefly introduce myself, my name's Lisa Connell. I'm an Assistant General Secretary in Forest Trade Union, and I cover members in the southeast of the country across health and local government employments. I'm just going to chair today's session and facilitate the conversation of, of today's panelists. Um, so just to briefly give you an overview in terms of the purposes of the of today's session and today's discussion, um, anyone who might have previously attended the Forza Campaigning Summer School We'll know um, last year we were sitting around in a room together listening to a number of different speakers speak on a number of very interesting and pertinent topics but just given the current i suppose global um pandemic that we're currently in under and as a result of COVID 19 we're taking a slightly different approach this year um, and having a number of different talks over the lunch hour on a number of different um, sessions. I actually think it's a very accessible way for our members to be able to engage on a wide series of different topics. But just from um, today's session, what we're going to be discussing is the issue of collective bargaining, which I think is a particularly interesting topic that we're going to cover in particular in light of last week's High Court decision around the whole area of um, sexual employment orders. Um, we have three very interesting speakers who are going to address um, the topic of collective bargaining. Um, the first speaker is going to be Kevin Duffy, who's a former chairperson of the Labour Court. Um, Adele McGinley, then, who is the director of the Mi Migrant Rights Centre, then will speak to the issue after Kevin. And then last but not least, then we'll have Michael Taft, who's a researcher in SIP2. Um, so just, I suppose, from a bit of a practical groundskeeping point of view, View, there is, you'll see in your screen there to the right hand side, there will be a, a long white box with Q&A to the top. If you have any questions for any of the speakers or for the panelists, would you mind just typing in your question and what we'll do is we'll come to the various different questions then after um, the final speaker, after Michael has addressed um, the topic. So um, just to kick off then, I'll introduce the first speaker. Um, so our first speaker today on um, the issue of collective bargaining is the infamous Kevin Duffy. Um, so Kevin was chairman of the Labour Court from December 2003 until his retirement in June 2016. Prior to Kevin's appointment as chairman of the court, he was deputy chairperson from 1997. He was a member of the European Association of Labour Court Judges from 2003 until his retirement in 2016. He co-authored reports from the Irish government on mandatory wage settling mechanisms in 2010 and on worker protection in cases of insolvency in 2016. Kevin also chaired a commission established by the Minister for Education and Skills that conducted a major overhaul of the Irish apprenticeship system in 2013. And before being appointed to the Labour Court, Kevin was Assistant General Secretary of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions with responsibility for industrial relations, trade union organization, and manpower policy. 
He represented ICTU on a number of ETUC and EU policy committees and was appointed chairman of the Commission of Public Service Pay in November 2016. In 2016, Kevin was also appointed to chair a commission of international experts to advise the Irish government on the future funding of water services. And he's also an adjunct professor, hope I'm saying that right, at law at the National University of Ireland, Maynooth, and is an honorary fellow of the National College of Ireland. In 2019, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in law by UCD, and he lectures in employment equality law at the Academy of European Law in Trier, another word I hope I'm saying right. Um, Kevin studied law at King's Inns Dublin, from which he holds the degree of Barrister at Law, and he's been called to the Irish Bar. So on that note, I'd like to introduce Kevin then to speak on this topic. A number of different headings. Um, firstly, maybe a bit of histrionics to look back at where, you know, the, when the problem evolved, maybe the various initiatives that have been taken from time to time to try and address it um, and to see what happened to them. The, I'd like to touch on, um, without going into great detail, uh, the question of whether legislation go, uh, to make collective bargaining mandatory might fall foul of the Constitution and perhaps to look also at recent judicial decisions around the question of uh, employment regulation or uh, the, the regulation of employment conditions by law uh, and, uh, and uh, including the recent one that uh, was referred to. Um, I then want to maybe pose a few questions and, and I think the question that uh, we really need to address is what are we talking about? What does recognition mean in a practical context? What would legislation uh, rendering it, it mandatory for an employer to engage in collective bargaining look like? Uh, to what extent is the voluntary system of collective of, of industrial relations that we have in this country and have had and uh, trade unions have espoused for many years, to what extent is that a factor that contributes to some of the difficulties that we experience? Um, and I then want to perhaps suggest some solutions and in particular to look at the possibility of having this dilemma addressed in a European context outside of our own legal framework. But to start off, I suppose the, 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 the problem really has been around as a, an active concern for the trade union movement from the early to mid nineties, certainly when I was working in Congress around that time, uh, it became a major issue because that was probably the start of the decline, which unfortunately has continued in trade union density in the private sector in particular. And the emergence in the Irish economy of very significant employments and sectors that didn't recognize trade unions and continue to refuse to recognize trade unions. Um, some progress was made on, on, on addressing the problem, particularly with the enactment of the Industrial Relations Amendment Act of 2001, which was subsequently amended. But the 2001 Act was an interesting experiment and for a long time was actually working until it was scuppered and we talk about, I'll talk about that later on in the now infamous Ryanair case. But the underlying rationale for the 2001 Act was, it didn't, it didn't, was often referred to as legislation on collective bargaining, it wasn't. It didn't require or couldn't require and the legislation precluded the Labour Court from recommending that an employer engage in collective bargaining. But what it did was this, it gave an employer a choice, two choices. It could engage in collective bargaining with a trade union, in which event the Act had no application to them. But if they didn't do that, the Labour Court could fix the paying conditions of employment for the workforce. 
and in its original form, the reference point for deciding what was fair and reasonable was organized employments where terms and conditions were determined by collective agreement. So for the purpose of comparison, right, you couldn't look at other non-union unorganized employments. You looked only at collective agreements in analogous title employments. And, and um, up to the time that the act was effectively discovered uh, by the Supreme Court in the Ryanair case, it was actually starting to work quite well. And a lot of employers opted to engage in collective bargaining rather than be on hazard of having conditions rammed down their throat over which they had no control. But, you know, for reasons that I'll touch on, that act fell foul of the courts. It was subsequently amended in 2015, but the amendments ran, that, that were introduced at that stage when it got over some of the difficulties in the Ryanair case, the fundamental flaw in the amended act is that whereas originally the reference point was unionized employments with our collective bargaining and collective agreements, now the reference point is employments generally within the sector in which the employer is located. So if you're trying to get, for example, if somebody goes out and organizes workers in refuge collection, where everybody is on the minimum wage, you're not going to get anything out of it. But so we're, we're, we're now many years on, so 25 years on since this debate really became live within the trade union movement. And that uh, right to bargain, uh, which is as elusive as ever. And that's the dilemma, I suppose, that we're all trying to address. One of the things that's almost become an empiricism nowadays when people talk about this, they say, well, there's a constitutional problem. And there are people advocating we should have a referendum. Now, leaving aside the difficulties that there might be in just getting a referendum, but getting a referendum passed around this, particularly given the uh, decline that has happened over the years in trade union density. Um, I don't ex believe that there is any clear legal authority for the proposition that legislation requiring employers to engage or to recognise trade unions, and we'll come back to what we mean by that, would be unconstitutional. There is nothing in the Constitution uh, that would point in that direction. Uh, sometimes reliance is placed by people who advocate that on one sentence in the judgment delivered by uh, Judge Gagan in the Supreme Court in the Reiner case. Uh, and what he said was, uh, it is not in dispute that as a matter of law, Reiner is perfectly entitled not to deal with trade unions. That's fine, as a matter of law, they weren't obliged to deal with him. But he then went on to say, nor can a law be passed compelling it to do so. So there's half a sentence on a point that was never argued, right? And the judge cited no authority for that, for whatever proposition was within that half a sentence. But um, so there is no clear authority on that, right? And I think it's important to remember that if the right, if there was a constitutionally protected right on the part of employers not to deal with trade unions, the strike in furtherance of recognition would be unlawful. You can't have a strike to bring about an unconstitutional result. And that's that was established way back in the 1960s in the uh, education company and, and Fitzpatrick case the one that held that there is a constitutional right not to join a trade union, right? And a, a strike to force people to join a trade union had a, an unconstitutional objective and was therefore unlawful. So if there is such a thing as a constitutional right not to join a trade union or not to recognize a trade union, 
it, it is in peril over a wide field. But there is no, and I think it's important to emphasize, there is no established legal authority for that proposition. But a, a recent experience in this field that you know would suggest a certain disposition on the part of the judiciary, right? Where any le legislation in this area would be scrutinized and would be subject to challenge. What the outcome could be, nobody could predict. Uh, because, you know, if you look at what the recent decisions in this area, and I touched on Ryanair, and Ryanair, the decision in Ryanair got a, 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 a lot of notoriety. Uh, and the outcome of the Ryanair case wasn't to strike down the law as unconstitutional, but to put in so many procedural aspects that had to be followed that would be impossible to operate it. There was the, a later, that, that was in 2007. In 2011, the High Court, uh, in a case called John Gray Sprite Chicken and versus the Labour Court, held that provisions of the 1946 Industrial Relations Act providing for employment regulation orders was unconstitutional, right? In McGowan and the Labour Court in 2013, the Supreme Court, struck down as unconstitutional provisions of the 1946 Act, which provided for registered employment agreements being universally applicable within the sector to which they related. And recently, last week, we had uh, NECI versus the Labour Court, the National uh, Electrical Contractors of Ireland, uh, and they challenged provisions of the uh, Industrial Relations Amendment Act 2015, which provided for sexual employment agreements. Now in all of, and they're, they're the four of us, there are other cases, but they're, 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 they're highlight, they highlight. And what was at the heart of all of these cases was uh, an argument that this was an interference in the right of employers and the courts would have said workers as well to enter into agreements with their own employer in a, 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 a system which is supposed to be voluntary. And here you had the intrusion of the law into industrial relations uh, and the employment relationship. And while they found different constitutional uh, and legal mechanisms to produce the result. When you read through those judgments, for example, in the, the, the most recent one, the Necky case, I call it, it's the actual, they, they adopted an Irish name for it, which is beyond me anyway, but it's the Necky case. <clears throat> and about two sentences into the judgment, Simon says, this legislation is a significant encroachment on the freedom of employers to contract. People should be free to agree. There's no attention to the inequality of arms between employers and, 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 and workers in that situation. But that brings us on then, <clears throat> assuming that legislation could be enacted, assuming that constitutional difficulties either don't exist or could be could be overcome. What do we mean when we talk about recognition? If I can answer my own question, it's generally understood to mean that an employer recognizes a trade union as the legitimate representative of its employees. And the employer accepts that the union is entitled to represent its members in matters of difference, but probably crucially, it accepts that issues arising between employers and employees should be resolved by collective bargaining and collective agreement. And logically, it follows from that 
that collective bargaining and collective agreements should be the normal mode by which pay and conditions of employment are to be determined. Now, I think that's a, you know, if you, you know, if you're looking for an analysis of what do we, what are we talking about? What does it mean? That's what it means, I think, to most, certainly trade union people and to most workers. Now, what's the problem with all of that? Right? As I said, uh, collective bargaining by its nature is a voluntary process. You can force people to sit in the same room, maybe make faces at each other. But how do you force somebody to bargain in the real sense, where both parties have as their objective to reach an agreement? How do you force somebody to do that? Uh, can you force somebody to negotiate? Uh, is there a mechanism by which you can force people to reach agreement? Uh, workers join unions in order to improve their terms and conditions of employment. And there's an abundance of experience around the place of where unions have organized in hostile employments, but haven't been able to achieve anything. And the organization quickly fell away. They achieved nothing. So there's a, an immediate dilemma there to say, well, how do you how do you actually do that? You can say you have to talk to the union, and you can. You can abuse the union. You can force people to sit in the same room. They can make faces at each other. But how do you force somebody? Historically, of course, the way it was done was for employers, the alternative was worse because if an agreement wasn't reached, there'd be a downer. People would go on strike, right? And the system worked very well when trade unions were strong. And it works very well right now where trade unions are strong. And the public sector is a good example of that. Right? But what about where trade unions are weak? And that's really what we're talking about here. Talking about trying to organize, establish trade union presence and collective bargaining in the private sector where trade union organization is extremely weak and getting weaker outside of some traditional uh, industries and employment that, that are still there. But all the, the new ones, the intels, the pharmaceutical industry, industries, all of these areas, um, going on strike is not an option. So how do you, what, if, and if, if, if going on strike was an option, we wouldn't have a problem. And to some extent, I mean, this, you know, maybe for a lot of people, this is, this is heresy, but I, I think it's something we need to think about, right? Our system is voluntary, it's a voluntary system. And, you know, that the unions have been the proponents of that for years, right? And it was a very good idea when unions were strong, right? Um, it means that unions, and employers are free to conduct their businesses to see fit with the minimum of legislative interference. That's the underlying rationale. Um, the, where unions have industrial muscle, um, they can enforce their will. Uh, in situations where they're weak, they can't. Right? Um, we have the WRC and the Labour Court in as to deal with industrial disputes, but the recommendations aren't binding. And you don't have to go. Uh, and Labour Court recommendations can be rejected. It, up to the time I left the Labour Court in 2016, it had become, it was very interesting. Uh, the, where there were rejections of Labour Court recommendations, the bulk of them were by employers. Not unions anymore. It was employers that rejected labour court recommendations. So that's our, our, our system, right? Um, so what do we talk? What what do people talk about? A lot of people on the union side look to Britain and say, well, look, they have a 
the system over there where if you get 50% or 40% rather than the ballot, the union has to recognise you. But that hasn't helped the unions in, in, in the UK. The UK has the um, one of the lowest uh, incidents of collective bargaining um, in Europe. Um, and it's significant that while the legislation in Britain was introduced by the, the Blair Labour Party government, Conservatives have left it there because it doesn't really work. Um, so I don't think that's the approach to go. We've we've had the amendment to the 2001 Act in the 2015 Act, um, but that hasn't worked either for the reasons that I mentioned. It was changed in a way which skewed it totally away from what was originally intended. And we now have a situation where there doesn't really appear to be any great political will to revisit this subject. So is there, what else can we consider? And I think that there are two things that I'd like to just talk about for a minute. One is, and one, this, this can be a problem, and it, people tell me, but even back in the old trade union days, it was a problem. <clears throat> the way unions get organized is, it's done from within. A couple of people, in an employment uh, and they work on colleagues and they build an organization. But we have protection for workers against penalization on a whole variety of grounds in this country. But there's no protection in Irish law against penalization for trade union activity. There is limited protection against dismissal but there's a whole lot of other ways. I mean, for example, whistleblowing. Em employers are now terrified of the consequences of penalising a worker who engages in whistleblowing in any way, because there are very serious consequences for that. There's no protection against penalisation for being a member of a trade union. But that's a, that's something that people overlook, right? Uh, so, Kevin, apologies not to interrupt, but if you wouldn't mind just starting. Oh, some, yeah, some sorry, I, 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 I'm getting carried away. Okay, what I, I feel we should be looking at is moving this debate on and looking at it in the European context. I mean, there are the, the, the uh, treaty on the functioning of the European Union at Article 156. Uh, obliges the Commission to encourage cooperation between member states and facilitate coordination of action in all uh, social policy fields, and it specifically includes collective bargaining. We have the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which guarantees the right to engage in collective bargaining. And in Europe, generally, there isn't a problem. And countries like France, which have low incidence of or low levels of uh, union membership, have collective bargaining coverage of about 95%. Right? And perhaps, you know, it's time to start thinking about whether trade unions within Europe should be campaigning to have a directive on collective bargaining so as to make it the normal mode of pay determination. And the beauty of that is, from our perspective, that European law is superior to domestic law, including constitutional law. So if something is done legislatively to give effect to a direction, it is immune from the scrutiny of the Irish courts. Right? Uh, but it also gets over the, a lot of that problem of trying to fiddle around with a system of industrial relations that really belongs to another century and to have to superimpose on that bits, bits of mandatory provisions, which are always going to be seen as anomalous and really not fitting in. And I, I, as I said, I've, I've come to the view at this late stage in my life that that's where the solution lies. It's a, it lies outside of this country. It lies within Europe. So, as I said, there are 
few thoughts to throw out and, and, and hopefully generate some debate around. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over time. I Great, just... thanks, Kevin. Um, and apologies to interrupt. I've been in the court and seen colleagues interrupt Labour court judges, and it definitely wasn't something I was <laughs> relishing um, in, in having to come in there. But there was definitely a lot of very interesting points that you had raised. and. Um, I, I think it's great that Adele is going to speak next, just because I thought it was interesting what you were saying around trying to organise in particular in within the um, private sector. And it might be something that Adele might uh, refer to within her contribution. So just to introduce Adele McGinley next, Adele is the director of the Migrant Rights Centre Ireland, where she has worked with the Migrant Rights Centre since 2006. In her time there, Adele has coordinated the Justice for the Undocumented campaign and held responsibility for the Migrant Rights Centre's communications. She's the current chair of the PICUM, the platform for the international cooperation on undocumented migrants, and a board member of Uplift, a multi-issue campaigning organisation. Adele previously coordinated two Equality for Women initiatives, including developing the Domestic Workers Action Group and work with migrant women in rural Ireland. Before joining the Migrant Rights Centre, Adele worked in a variety of um, roles, including social care and youth work positions. Adele has a BA in Applied Social Studies, an MA in Globalisation, and diplomas in Youth and Community Work and Digital Media Technology. So I'd like to welcome Adele now to speak to the top topic on collective bargaining. Thanks, uh, Lisa, for that, and, and thanks, Kevin, also for um, a comprehensive overview. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, approach um, and maybe talk a little bit uh, about uh, the work that we do, um, who we work with, and why we think collective and sector bargaining is important for migrant workers um, and vulnerable workers, and particularly for workers in hostile workplaces in the private sector. Um, that's mainly where, where we would work. Um, I suppose MRCI has been working with um, migrant workers in low pay for almost 20 years. Um, sectors um, where you know there often is low uh, trade union density, it's labour intensive work, workplaces are isolated and individualised, um, exploitation is commonplace, uh, as is non compliance. Um, with, with basic employment law. So I know we're talking about collective bargaining, but in some cases, uh, it, it, people we work with, it's even hard to claim your, your very basic rights um, under under national legislation as it is. Um, so we would see that as quite a big problem around uh, compliance and enforcement um, as well. Um, I suppose we work uh, with people in restaurants, in domestic and home care, in agri-food and fishing, the small retailers, security, um, so kind of a wide spectrum of, of people. Um, and I suppose maybe to say why we kind of think it's important um, and just maybe to give you kind of a paint a picture. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we are talking about fishers, for example, who might work on small boats who tend to be out at sea for seven to 14 days and get paid like two euros an hour. Important to have those this group of workers um, represented and uh, collective bargaining for, for, for them. Um, even domestic workers and home care workers, many of whom during the pandemic have been cocooning with older people working 24 seven, receiving no extra pay, no nighttime rates, no days off. Uh, another group of workers um, that are very vulnerable uh, in the labor market at the moment. Mushroom workers paid by the kilo uh, remaining on training rates, working for very long periods of time, having you know uh, little rest breaks. Uh, niche factory workers um, that we've seen whose health and safety um, has been a kind of uh, consistent and recurring issue um, over the last number of years. In the recent clusters, I suppose during COVID nineteen, has showed you know just a total disregard. Um, for the health and safety of workers um, in, in the workplace. Um, and so restaurant workers, KPs, chefs, waiting staff, receiving less than a minimum wage, working beyond the hours are being paid for. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it, it paints a very poor picture of what our labour market is. 
um, we have the vulnerable workers in the labour in the labour market, um, and I suppose moving to a collective bargaining approach, we you know we, we would like to see um, laws that enshrine the rights of workers to collectively bargain with their in, employer. Obviously, we're a long, long way away from that, and just maybe picking up on on. It, it do, you know it, it can force employers to the to the table um and gives the power to workers to negotiate but workers have to also continue to be able to withdraw their labor these tactics and tools to to actually make them sit down and 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 have those and have those discussions um it is it yeah it's it, i suppose that's really really important i just want to talk a little bit around sectoral bargaining as well um, obviously, it can be slightly different, and we, we've. I think there's both positives and negatives to this approach. Um, I mean, we see how vulnerable people are in in the labour market. We also see how vulnerable um, the legislation is, um, like the recent, obviously, high court decision, saying it's unconstitutional. Um, and I suppose we. I think we also have to ask ask the question. I know Kevin was saying that you know uh, you know trade union membership is low, but I suppose with sector bargaining, if we're talking about sectors like fishers or meat or mushrooms or, 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 or factory workers, um, there's a lot to to be said in terms of having sector agreements, but it can also undermine uh, the potential for organised um uh, an organised and, and powerful work workforce. And it can also, I suppose, risk setting a floor than a ceiling. So, I do think there are things we have to kind of really consider as well, and um, when we when we talk about um, uh, sector bargaining as well. Um, but I do think, you know, obviously, as I said, important for like a fisher or a domestic worker, where it is very hard to organise uh, that they have that they have protections in their employment and that there are. Uh, better rates of pay and that they're specific to their sectors because obviously you know somebody's out at sea for a long period of time or they're working uh 24 hours in a, in, in in a private home that they need very specific um uh, responses to to their particular needs um the same with seasonal workers uh obviously very um um vulnerable to exploitation particularly fruit pickers and workers who might be coming from um within the eu or, or, or in other places um actually the department of justice wants to, or sorry department department of enterprise training and employment i think it is now again um are looking to introduce seasonal work permits and um, so this makes workers very very vulnerable i think it's important to understand when there's an immigration status attached to somebody's um, right to work in the labour market, but that can have other types of implications for people. Uh, it can make them vulnerable to um, uh, losing their immigration status, status and becoming undocumented. We'd be against uh, seasonal work permits being introduced um, uh, without kind of uh, proper protections and uh, enforcement compliance mechanisms. Again, going back to very basic, uh, very basic stuff um, for, for, for workers. Um, and um yeah so i i i won't talk too much more because i know we're sort of running out of time so um i suppose it's just picking up maybe on what kevin said i mean i don't have the answers to this at all um <laughs> um and unfortunately we have a very hostile minister who's just um come into into the remit of employment and um so it's kind of hard to see the way forward in, in some of this right now um and yeah i think it's um but obviously there's quite a need in a particular a, a very specific need for for workers in very very vulnerable sectors who um who maybe it, it is harder to organize to connect with um Workers who may not know their rights who find it very difficult to claim their rights. Um, so it is it's an approach that is 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 very much needed uh, along with the kind of sector agreements as well. Um, but there are you know as I said risks to that um, in terms of um, organising and organising for power and um, ensuring and maintaining the ability of workers to strike and to withdraw their labour because that's where um, obviously power comes from. Um, so. Yeah, 
I'll leave it at that and put up with it. Maybe some comments and questions. Great, Adele. Thanks for that. That was um, a very comprehensive overview that you provided. One one area that I uh, that you referenced that I think um, during COVID, it has been particularly shown in terms of the value of that sector given um, the pandemic we're in is um, certainly for restaurant workers and um, you know those working in supermarkets. Um, and I I think without COVID, it wouldn't we wouldn't have necessarily drawn that level of recognition to the value and the importance of the work that they are doing. So um, definitely a very interesting area that you have covered. Um, so just to introduce our final speaker, um, last but not least, is Michael Taft. He's a researcher with SITU and also author of the Political Economy blog, Notes on the Front. His research interests include fiscal policy, employee compensation and enterprise policy. Michael has presented at a range of conferences in Ireland and abroad. So I'd like to welcome Michael now to speak on, on the issue. Okay, thank you, uh, Lisa, and thank you to um, <clears throat> uh, Forcer for inviting me here. I'm just gonna pull up the power, my PowerPoint. I don't know, is that visible? Um, yeah, no, that's cool. No, thanks, Michael. Okay, I'm gonna move this through this pretty quickly so we can get to some Q&A. Uh, usually when trade unionists argue for uh, collective bargaining, they frame it in terms of a right, a labor right, a civil right, uh, a human right. I think this is a this is obviously a correct argument, but it may not be sufficient to win over the public debate because it can be easily countered. Collective bargaining would undermine our competitiveness. It would add costs to our enterprise base. It would reduce business flexibility. Democracy takes too many meetings. Uh, in short, it can be argued that collective bargaining impedes economic growth and, jo uh, uh, and job creation. Uh, so when we popularize collective bargaining in a number of ways and a range of arguments, we should pay special attention to the argument of economic efficiency. We need to show that collective bargaining improves economic and enterprise outcomes. Just briefly, just to get some uh, perspective, uh, um, uh, in our uh, EU peer group, that's other high income Northern and Central European economies, three quarters of all employees are covered under collective bargaining arrangements. And as you can see there in the graph, some are exceed over 90%. Uh, Ireland is uh, about a third. It is at the bottom of the table, way at the bottom. And if you take out the public sector, you're probably looking at about a 15% collective bargaining coverage for the private sector. Um, now, in terms of the general economic benefits, the benefits to the economy, European Trade Union Institute has done some excellent work on correlating collective bargaining coverage and workplace democracy with economic outcomes. And they found that countries with, high, with strong collective bargaining coverage and union density have higher levels of wages, greater wage equality, higher employment rates, higher life satisfaction, but we have to be careful about this argument because collective bargaining can't be said to cause these outcomes. There are other policies that have an equal and possibly even a greater role like investment, taxation, public services. But what it does show is that collective bargaining is not a bar to uh, economic and social performance. And here we have uh, a correlation between the Global Competitiveness Index that is compiled by the World Economic Forum, those folk who bring us Davos mm -hmm. Summit every year, uh, and they, they, you know, they're a pro-business group. But what we see is that all those countries with much higher levels than ourselves of collective bargaining coverage also rank much higher than us in terms of uh, business competitiveness. So there again, there's not a, um, uh, a, a uh, uh, there's not a bar to that. Um, uh, the problem with debating at this at that macro level, at the economic level, is it can be sometimes abstract. So we have to take the debate to the firm level, to the level of the enterprise, to the shop floor, the factory floor, the building site. And when we do this, we find that the arguments for collective bargaining, if anything, become even stronger. I mean, there's studies, surveys, reports uh, that find collective bargaining at the firm level, at the enterprise, uh, uh, produces better outcomes. Now, I mean, I'm not gonna go through all these. I have a number of quotes. I'd like to thank Daniel Higgins, my colleague in SIP2, for compiling most of this, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I can uh, have my email at the end and people can uh, email me, I can send them a copy of the PowerPoint. But you see there's uh, one, some examples there. 
of um, uh, studies and surveys, more examples, and some more examples, and one more example. I mean, Nick, you, you, could, fill, you could fill a book with all the examples of studies and surveys that show at the firm level, at the business level, collective bargaining improves with performance. Uh, we know this because there are benefits to the firm outside of just benefits to employees. And these would include establishing mechanisms for resolving debates, uh, greater predictability in terms of wages, engaging in forward planning, reducing agency costs and like that. So the question becomes, um, uh, sorry here, yeah, the question becomes, if collective bargaining produces all these great and wonderful outcomes, what's the problem? Why don't we have this? Well, we shouldn't assume, first off, that all management operates to best practice. Uh, Irish Management Institute, Management Development Council, Enterprise Ireland, and the expert group on future skill needs have all produced reports highly critical of indigenous management quality. So if there's one matter of competence, there's also a matter of ideological capture. Uh, it may well be that management uh, is captured by uh, uh, ideologies which uh, are well out of date and, uh, uh, you know, I've not kept up uh, with the modern uh, enterprise. Others argue still that management actually acts autonomously, that it's a distinct interest in the company, different from that of shareholders and certainly workers and all that. In other words, management opposes intrusions on their status and discretion and collective bargaining, trade unions, employee participation, state regulations, community demands, uh, 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 narky shareholders, all of them attempt to uh, confine, you know, attempt to uh, intrude on their status and discretion. So management assumes that what's in their interest is in the firm's best interest. Uh, and that's why you can have the situation where they don't adopt uh, best practice. However, if it is the case that democratic practices, such as collective bargaining, actually increase firm product productivity, then when management opposes those practices, they're actually undermining firm performance. They're undermining enterprise outcomes. Now, if this holds true as a general principle, we find some pretty interesting consequences. I mean, take, for instance, workers who go take out and go on industrial action over recognition. They are not only struggling for their right to bargain, they are also struggling to increase firm level performance. Now, that may not be their subjective intent, but that is an objective consequence if they succeed. And this example has even one more twist. If workers are successful, the productive productivity and performance gains will also flow to the shareholders. Now, I'm not suggesting that workers uh, go out on strike and start chanting, you know, what do we want? Improved firm level productivity in flattened hierarchy organizational structures. And when do we want it now? No, but I think that it actually uh, it would be interesting if we don't just dismiss this as irrelevant, if we don't take this principle to its logical conclusion, Let's kind of see, I think that this is actually inviting us to re-look at the enterprise in a different way. The, the pandemic crisis has certainly brought a new uh, focus to the role of firms. These are the places where essential workers produce essential goods and services. We now understand that businesses have necessary roles in protecting public health and safety beyond their own workforce. And we also know that businesses cannot function without massive public subsidy. Now, Sean Lamash wrote back in 1957, uh, he said, nobody regards the operation of an important industrial undertaking as being the exclusive private concern of its owners. These businesses are looked upon as national assets and the manager has responsibilities wider than those placed on him by his employer. He should be regarded and regard himself as a public servant in the finest meaning of that term. That's one heck of a description for a private sector manager. Uh, and that was written over 50 years ago. The crisis has revealed what was always the case, that business is a social asset with social responsibilities that are democratically uh, set and accountable to a larger range of interests than just its owners. But this raises a question. If business is a social or national asset, who owns it? Now, here's the thing, business and legal scholars 
have known for a long time. No one owns a corporation. It is a legal fiction. Mm -hmm. John Kay, writing in the Financial Times, writes that uh, share, shares do not give their holders uh, a right of possession and a right of use. The UK Court of Appeal uh, and the House of Lords ruled that shareholders are not uh, part owners of the company. Owning shares cannot be equated with ownership of the company. If that's the case, if no one owns a corporation, what are, how do we understand this? Similar to a social asset, we understand it as a social space, a space where a complex network of contracts between various stakeholders take place, shareholders, workers, management, suppliers, creditors, uh, on and on and now as we understand with the environment. Now, shareholders may not own the company, but they exercise power. But we must remember that that power is not a natural market phenomena. That power derives from politics and law. Indeed, the corporation is itself a product of law. So in stakeholder theory, a business is a vehicle for coordinating all these stakeholder interests. It's not a vehicle for maximizing shareholder profit. Management is uh, uh, ac accountable to all stakeholders. And the, go the goal of management is to balance their interests for the good of the firm to maximize the performance of the firm. This is an inherently democratic theory and is making a comeback. The problem is that it's business interests that are championing uh, stakeholder theory. Uh, recently, uh, a group of major CEOs in the US wrote that shareholder value is no longer their main objective. Rather, the investing in stakeholders should be the overriding goal of business. IBEX Director General Danny McCoy called for a whole stakeholder involvement approach. Now, this is not some fall off the donkey Damascus moment. They see where the curve is heading and they want to get ahead of it. If they can do so, they will be able to define the terms and roles of the stakeholders uh, and it will, uh, uh, not, not us. So what we have to do is, and I'm just trying to, what we have to do is enter the debate. Um, well, okay, uh, thing froze, but I'll just finish off. We have to enter the debate uh, knowing that actually the employers right now own the debate. They, uh, they monopolize the terms like competitiveness, efficiency, productivity. Uh, and one of the main reasons why they monopolize it is quite simply because, um, uh, quite simply because uh, trade unionists don't involve themselves in the debate. They run away from the debate. They don't contest business and conservative interests over these things. So therefore, we have to enter the debate that uh, 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 means that we challenge the idea of what makes a firm work. What is the best outcome for that enterprise? We've already seen uh, and we have all the evidence that collective bargaining and other democratic practices improves the outcome of the firm. We know that increased democracy, participation, and accountability uh, uh, provides additional benefit uh, to the firms. So uh, the point is, in conclusion, uh, that we should, using this moment now, knowing that we have business interests that are lining up down the block, looking for subsidies and tax breaks, uh, uh, and what we shouldn't allow happen is um, a situation like we had in the last crisis, where businesses received billions of euros. The hospitality sector, for instance, received billions of euro, euros in, um, ta in the VAT cut subsidies, uh, and then just ignored the state's industrial relations machinery. Good for the employers. They doubled their profits within six years. Doubled their profits in six years. Workers only received over the same period, only we got a 7% increase uh, in their wages. So it too has called for subsidies to be linked to collective bargaining and to be linked uh, to oversight uh, uh, by uh, trade unions in their relevant sectors. This is a correct argument. It's one that we should establish, but one that we do so because we've entered into the debate quite simply if we do not lead this debate, we will be led.
if uh, we do not challenge these issues regarding who are the stakeholders and the equality between the stakeholders, we will be left behind. Uh, uh, so that is the challenge for the trade union movement uh, to make collective bargaining an uh, economic and fiscal necessity in terms of recovery. Thank you. Great, my question. Um, very interesting contribution. I'll move directly to questions now, um, if that's all right with the panelists. Um, just because a few questions have come in um, from the participants. So I suppose just initially what I'll do is I have a set of three questions that I might put to the speakers in reverse order, maybe just um, in the interest of fairness. So I'll just go through the three questions and you can respond to any of the questions, maybe just one of the questions or each of the questions. You might even have um, just a few um, small remarks on maybe some of the other issues that were discussed as well. So just very quickly, the first question is, given the low levels of understanding and awareness of collective bargaining and industrial relations amongst many in Ireland, do the speakers believe that a constitutional referendum campaign on collective bargaining rights could bring about our yes equality movement and repeal movement on workers' rights? Second question is the most recognized <coughs> employee workers union representatives in Ireland's public service is Force and SIP2. Can the um, employer refuse to recognize other worker reps that may wish to arrange a setup? And then just the third question is, what kind of challenges do you think we would encounter in convincing the wider public of the need for collective bargaining, which I think is linked into the first question as well. So, Michael, if you don't mind responding first, let's put John the spot. Okay, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just take uh, question number three, uh, which is, um, what kind of challenges do you think we would encounter in convincing the wider public of the need for collective bargaining? First thing is to tell them what it is, explain to them what it is. I imagine if you took a poll or even just a kind of one of these box pop kind of polls walking down the street and ask people, do you know what collective bargaining is? Most people would say no. And unfortunately, it's the people who need it the most that are probably the least acquainted with it. So the trade union movement has an enormous task in explaining not only what collective bargaining is, but to do so in a language uh, that is relevant to people today. I mean, collective bargaining, it does sound very uh, Fordist, you know, it's, not, it's kind of redolent of collective farming and all those type of things. We've got to speak a language that uh, uh, not only that, that, that people get that is relevant to them, but to show them in concrete terms in their workplace, in their situation, uh, the benefits of collective bargaining. But first off, we have to tell them what it is. Great, thanks, Michael. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe just to on the um, referendum and um, the need to convince people. Um, obviously, it's a huge challenge, um, but I suppose when we look at those campaigns, they were very story led, um, people led, um, and values led. So, in order to maybe, and, and maybe it's not a referendum campaign because I don't know if that would, would be the, the best approach because I think we're on a, a low and a weak footing. Um, maybe it is legislative change, um, and I suppose there is some opportunities, um, maybe that we can we can capitalise. But I, I, I generally in campaigning, show don't tell, uh, use values, frame your message, tell stories, um, have it people led. Um, so if we if 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 we can do something like that, and that has to be thought through, um, there there's a chance for collective bargaining. We have to have people who are effective at the centre. Uh, they need to be telling their stories of why it's important to them, um, and we need to make it real in people's lives, real to people, and what that actually means. Because otherwise, if we talk about economics and the value of, um, I think we lose the general public sometimes in, in in how we speak about things. So I think it's really important if something like that was to go ahead to really think it through and how that might work. Great, and I'll just pass it over now to Kevin. Okay, well, I, 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 as you said, that the questions one and question three are, are, are raise the same issues. Um, I suppose there's another point in the, if you were to have a referendum, leaving aside my views that I expressed and whether or not it's, absolutely, it's actually necessary, but if you did, 
what do you have a referendum on? Don't have a referendum to say collective bargaining is a good thing. We could handle that all right. But are you saying collective bargaining must be, it's mandatory, has to be engaged in? What, what exactly? We, we've never really defined what we'd have a referendum on. Um, but the problems that would be encountered, I have no doubt you'd get in the intels of this world and many other big businesses uh, who would say, we leave here. We came into Ireland on the basis that we didn't have to recognise a union. And we won't. And we go. Look, they might mean it, but they'll scare a lot of people. And that's a problem. Right? And given the fact that, you know, for an awful lot of people out there, it really isn't something that they lie awake at night and, and, and concern themselves with. Um, so it's different from, you know, the, the, our recent experience on the Eighth Amendment and the uh, equality referendum. Um, there will the, be huge amounts of money pumped in to opposing this. There's a really problem there. And I think, you know, we going down that road in circumstances where the outcome might, uh, might not be what we want could do an awful lot of damage. But we still are back to the point about what exactly do we want to legislate on? How do we deal with the, uh, making collective bargaining mandatory without a significant overhaul of our industrial relations system? Because at the end of the day, there will always be cases where people disagree. Maybe because they don't want to agree. Maybe they're not convinced. And while all of the arguments, I accept totally the very compelling arguments that have been advanced by Michael there, but there are people who are just aren't, aren't interested. They want to keep going the way they are. Um, and it's for that reason that I, 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 I touched on the, um, the possibility of dealing with this in Europe. Now, I see there are other questions on that, which I presume you'll come back to. And I'd like to comment on, on the, uh, the, 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 the reason why that, is a maybe a better uh, approach but you know i i i'm still i i would be i would be slow to go down the road of a referendum right now and i think there are other approaches that should be adopted apart from the fact that i think legislation can be enacted in this field could be challenged um but um, i i i i i i would be very fearful of uh, a referendum going pear shaped. Great. And um, I'll just ask a final round to the speakers and um, just to finish up as well. And um, so the next question is Does the panel feel that there will be any gains for the trade union movement and strengthening collective bargaining with the new government? Um, the next question is, what is the view of the panel on the calls to repeal the Industrial Relations Act? And then the last question is, in the opinion of the panel, what is the current standing of collective bargaining and social partnership in Ireland? Is there still engagement or have some groups withdrawn in recent years? So we might uh, finish as we started and I'll, I'll take Kevin, then Adele and then Michael, if that's all right. Just to unmute yourself there, Kevin. I beg your pardon. No, sorry about that. Well, I, I suppose I'll take them in no particular order. I don't see where repealing the, it was, I presume it's just Relations Act 1990 that the, the questioner has in mind. Um, if you repeal the Industrial Relations Act 1990, strikes would be illegal. That's the fact. It's, then There's nothing there to give, to, to protect workers who go on strike. Right? Maybe people feel that they, they the Industrial Relations Act should be amended, but repealing the Industrial Relations Act means that the law governing trade disputes is the Conspiracy and Protection of Property Act of 1875. You couldn't go on strike, but, and it's not really relevant, right? Um, in terms of, of the, what was the other questions again? The, the, let me just have a look at me, me, me screen here. Um, the next question was, um, do you feel that there will be any gains for the trade union movement and strengthening collective bargaining with the new government? Probably not. Probably not. I can answer that fairly quickly. I don't think there's, there's any. Um, the, the, the trade 
and work, and I'm, I'm, I've no doubt we'll work hard to try and convince them to do something, but um, nothing in the programme for government that gives any hope um, on that one. Um, and um, I just want to touch perhaps and make one point because I think it's important and I think it's relevant to the, you know, the, 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 the graph that Michael put up about collective bargaining in Europe and all the rest of it. The beauty of that is that for the vast majority of member states, this is not a problem. Active that applied rules to everybody be a problem. I think that needs to be considered, right? And that gets over your constitutional questions. As I said, you don't need to concern yourself with a referendum or interference by the domestic courts uh, if a, a law is enacted to give effect to a directive. So really, that's something I think that we, you know, we should be thinking about. Thanks, Kevin. I'll go to Adele next. Um. Let me just follow on on from uh, Kevin's train of thought. Obviously, there's a lot of money um, going to be distributed and picking up on what Michael said uh, to businesses and to others. Um, and, um, you know, we see the negotiations on the European level at the moment in terms of um, where some of that stimulus package will go and how that will be administered. Um, and, you know, is there opportunities to attach kind of certain um conditions or safeguards probably not a full collective bargaining but because the program for government is so weak on on worker rights is there is, is there opportunities particularly in the delivery of public funds um to businesses to 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 look at upholding rights for workers in in some particular way um does that does that you know is there something there for us to to, to think about and think through about how we can attach conditionalities to some of that um in terms of social partnership, I do agree with Michael. So we've seen in the Department of Taoiseach there's going to be uh, a focus on social dialogue. What that means, I don't know. Um, it will be important to get uh, both from a trade union and a community voluntary sector perspective, get get uh, get our thoughts into that about how that might be conducted or run, what that looks like, um, who will be there, who will not be there. Um, so I think it's really that's really important as well in terms of um kind of um next steps as well. Um and yeah, I suppose I'm not that hopeful because of the minister that we have, you know, Leo Riker and you know, kind of the history, uh his history and um but you know, there's always opportunities and chinks in the armor that I think we always have to kind of search for and and, and keep uh uh, being optimistic, because I, I suppose what what has you know throughout COVID nineteen as well, it has been uh, it, it's been a very difficult working environment and very difficult for workers. But there has been a lot for, a lot of opportunities as well for workers to assert their rights. Um, to particularly around health and safety legislation, um, and there are there are external opportunities. So I do think we need to figure out what the opportunities are and to, and and to um to to seize on those. Thanks, Adela. And then, Michael, you don't just have the task of responding to the three questions, but there's also an additional question for yourself of, do you have a book on the issues that you've spoken on? You might just refer people to where your blog is as well, just because it's obviously an interesting, very interesting topic. You're just on mute there, Michael. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, just on the question of, you know, abolishing the 1990 Act, replacing it with other legislation, constitutional referendum. Let, let's, let's just kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, get a hold of ourselves here. A movement that has only 15% density in the private sector is not going to win a referendum. And no a government, and especially a government like Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, are not going to listen to them. I mean, you know, our old friend, Comrade Joe, uh, was correct when he asked how many battalions that they have. At the end of the day, the 1990 Act, or the lack of a, a collective bargaining legislation, or whatever the Constitution was, they are not an impediment to us going out and organizing workers. 
It is not an impediment for us to go out and win people over to the idea of trade unionism. Now, is it an obstacle? Yes. But when have we, you know, when have we never, you know, we've always had obstacles. Uh, so it's actually the hard work of organization to build up your strength, not only in individual workplaces and sectors, but in the economy as a whole. So that, you know, I think Joe may, uh, sorry, Kevin made a really interesting point. The volunteer system really worked well when the trade unions were strong and they could, you know, they could punish employers if they didn't come to the table. Well, right now we don't have that ability. And until we get that ability, you know, I fear that the debate is not going to make it, you know, we're not going to make a meaningful contribution to the debate. Uh, or if we do make a meaningful contribution, no one will listen to us. We're not relevant. So we've got to work hard uh, to, to make ourselves relevant. And there is no shortcut to doing that. It is just the hard work of convincing people that trade union trade union is good for them. Uh, is there a book on what I talked about? Actually, no. Uh, not from a not from a progressive or trade union perspective, there isn't, because unfortunately, we haven't uh, engaged these matters. Uh, there's a tendency, you know, I, I, I understand it at one level. Uh, you know, to talk about competitiveness or to talk about flexibility and all that. Well, aren't you then going on? Aren't you walking into the employer's sandbox? Well, yeah, you are. You are, and you have to. Uh, uh, you have to get in that sandbox uh, with a different perspective and a different idea, because that's how that's how you lead people. If you absent yourselves from those debates, uh, you won't be able to do so. So, you know, yes, there's a book to be written from a uh, uh, a progressive perspective. I mean, I know, that, you know, some of my friends, you know, call for, uh, uh, you know, the working class to take over uh, the means of production. Uh, I, that'd be great, you know? Let, yeah, let's do it, let's do it tomorrow. But uh, until such time as we can achieve that, why don't we try to figure out how we can make enterprises work, how we can make these vehicles of producing goods and services work? That would be a great step. If you do that in combination with organizing, then I think the trade unions really start to become relevant. Great. So just before finishing up, I might ask Kevin, Michael, or Adele if you have any final concluding remarks you'd like to put to the webinar or if we're okay at that. Okay, well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Kevin, Michael, and Adele for their time today and for giving us a really interesting and comprehensive overview on a wide range of um, different areas within the topic of collective bargaining. Um, hopefully everyone who viewed um, found it very interesting. I know this is a very different format um, and um, it, there's, it's definitely a different experience watching everything on the screen, but I definitely think um, it was very engaging and uh, a, a very interesting talk on, on this on this topic. So I'd just like to thank everyone again for tuning in for uh